Good afternoon and good morning to all our audiences joining from different parts of the globe. A very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of Mission for Vision. My name is Srikant Ayangar. I lead the communication efforts at Mission for Vision and I'm delighted to be your host for this webinar. Before we begin, here are some brief housekeeping notes. The webinar is currently being streamed live on YouTube for our audiences and I would encourage you to share your questions via the comment section available on YouTube. This webinar is also being recorded and will be available to watch later. For this webinar today, we have experts and leaders from the eye health sector and the renewable energy space. They will be sharing their views on the greener approaches towards eye care delivery and discuss the priorities and actions that promote environmentally sustainable practices in the eye health sector. I'm now delighted to hand over to Mr. Tulsi Raj Ravila, who will be the moderator for this webinar. Mr. Tulsi Raj is the founding member and the executive director of Lions Arvind Institute of Community Ophthalmology, also known as LICO. He is the director of operations at the Arvind Eye Care System and also the co-founder of the IAPB's Climate Action Working Group. Thank you, Mr. Tulsi Raj, for joining us today and agreeing to moderate this webinar. I will let you take over from here. Uh, thank you. Uh, Shrikant. First, my uh, gratitude to both um, uh, Mission for Vision and uh, Elizabeth you know, for uh, coming up with this uh, important topic for discussion. So I'll just take a few minutes to set the broad context. Uh, let me just share a slide. Just want to be sure that you're seeing my slide in full screen. Okay, good. Um, so, so why should we be concerned about this? Uh, the the one, one reason is that uh, across the world, uh, healthcare is becoming a significant uh, contributor for uh, carbon emission you know, across the world. And of course, the extent to which uh, it happens, uh, varies uh, from country to country. Uh, today, if, uh, and then as a result of this, uh, what we are seeing is uh, not just because of healthcare, but then overall due to climate change, uh, we are seeing a lot of disasters, you know, heat waves. And uh, uh, even a week ago when I was listening to the radio, uh, in the Bay Area, the temperature was at 101 degrees, and this was at 7.30 in the evening. When such, such high weathers are not known, uh, where the temperature is normally much cooler, uh, we see floods and, and all kinds of uh, uh, disruptions happening. And I think this is just the beginning of uh, what we are likely to uh, see escalate uh, over time. Uh, and in all this, what we have to be concerned is that the, today, uh, the trend is increasing. That, that is the contribution made by uh, the health sector is steadily increasing year after year. Now, what you're seeing is a graph of uh, 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 carbon emissions from U.S. healthcare which is, I think I'm showing this particularly because the U.S. is a very mature health market. You know, so the growth rate is fairly small. In spite of it, uh, the, the carbon emissions by U.S. in 2013 was uh, at 10%, and today it's estimated to be around 14 15%. So when it comes to India, one, we have to recognize that today our health coverage is very low. No, and then there's a lot of efforts are being done to uh, increase this coverage. Uh, our population is aging very rapidly. Healthcare needs will increase. So over time, the 4% contribution by India, if it was business as usual, might exceed even what the U.S. does you know, in terms of their contribution to the green gas emission. So I think we really have a, a challenge to, to really address this. And, and we, we need to recognize that when we deliver care, we obviously have to use a lot of resources. Now, whether it is 
uh, on the investment side, you know, consumables, capital, goods, and, and so on. Uh, and then the, the protocols and things like that, which drive its usage. So this is inevitable. You know, because if you, if you want to provide care, you're going to use resources. So we need to really figure out how to do this in the most uh, efficient manner. And this is what we're hoping to hear uh, from others in the next um, uh, 70 minutes uh, or so that we have you know, before we wind up at 4.15. Uh, so just in concluding my uh, part of this initial remarks, uh, what we really need to be concerned as healthcare providers is that at one side, uh, we need resources. I mean, this is what you see on the right side uh, under infrastructure. Uh, it could be building, it could be energy, it could be consumables. You know, all of that stuff is the resource side. And, and, uh, and, and it's, uh, it is absolutely essential that we need those resources. Uh, and even there, we can apply our uh, uh, thinking uh, to, to make them um, uh, as uh, environment friendly as possible, uh, resulting in uh, reduced usage, reduced maintenance, all of that can go on the resource side. And then on an ongoing basis, the resources are used and they get used as per our protocol, as per our efficiency, as per our productivity, now, which again is in our hands to moderate. You know, so, so this is a big picture uh, approach, uh, I, I think, for uh, uh, addressing this issue. Uh, so with this, I'll, I'll uh, stop the broad introduction and uh, hand it back to Sri to introduce our keynote speaker. Oh, thank you so much for those insights, Mr. Tulsi Raja, and giving us a, actually a 360 deg degree view on the subject. I'm sure there'll be a lot of key takeaways and learnings from others on the subject. Great. Uh, we now move on to our first speaker and the keynote address, Ms. Mitasha Yu. Mitasha is a co-chair of the Climate Action Working Group at the International Agency for Prevention of Blindness and also works for the World Health Organization in the Vision and Eye Care Program. She is a public health expert with over 16 years of experience in public health eye care international development and clinical optometry. She's passionate about promoting the link between climate change and eye care and climate action strategies the sector can implement. Over to you, Matasha. Thank you, Shrikant. I'm just gonna share my screen with you now. Just let me know if you can see it all clearly. Yeah? Yes, it's all clear. Great. So firstly, I just want to say a happy World Environment Day to everyone that was happening earlier this month. And thank you to everyone that has joined us today to hear about one of the most important issues of our generation. So you might be wondering why those of us working in the eye care sector are talking about climate change. At first glance, the topic seems a bit foreign and not related to eyes. In fact, I probably would have said the same thing to you a few years ago too. But there is in fact a link. You might remember the devastating bushfires we had in Australia a few years ago now, where it seemed like half the country was burning down. Although I live in the urban area in Australia, the fires were in the rural area, but still it affected us. For three months, every morning when I woke up, all I could smell was smoke. We were advised not to go outside and we were trapped indoors. Experts put these fires to climate change. With it being so close to home, I really got the motivation to look at what more I can be doing. Surely working in eye care, there can be something. And then I learned there is a lot we can actually be doing. And I'm gonna share a bit of that with you today. So as uh, Tulsi nicely um, introduced, there is immense, immense damage that's happening to our environment globally. There's more extreme weather events that's happening, the storms, the floods, the um, fires, there's rising temperatures and sea levels, the spread of disease, devastation in habitats and increase in air pollution. Last year, the devastating facts presented in a report by the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change stated that human activity is unequivocally the cause of these rapid changes to climate. And they warn us that it's gonna be more widespread and the extreme weather events are going to occur more in the future. 
Unfortunately, we know that this will disproportionately impact the poor and vulnerable populations. That includes women and girls, people with disabilities, including vision impairment and blindness, and people living in remote and rural communities. We have to think of climate change as not just an environmental issue, but also a health and development issue. So how does it impact the eyes? How does climate change really impact the eyes? So we will see that there will be a predicted increase in eye infections such as trachoma due to the water contamination and poor sanitation. We'll see there'll be an increased um, occurrence of cataracts, early onset and accelerated progression of them, and increased occurrence of ocular lesions such as cancers of the eye due to the excess UV. We'll see a predicted increase in allergic eye disease, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration due to the poor air quality and air pollution. And we will also see increase in disruption of eye care services due to the extreme weather events that will increase. In times of crisis, we know that only core health services may be prioritized, which often leaves out eye care. So we saw this during the COVID-19 pandemic when there was almost a universal suspension of crucial eye health services such as cataract surgeries and distribution of glasses. Something similar like this can happen again when there's extreme weather events. So the, the disruption to the critical eye services, in addition to the predicted increase in eye disease, will further exacerbate the situation. So how does eye care contribute to climate change? And Tulsi alluded to this a bit beforehand. Globally, healthcare is a massive consumer of resources and a major emitter of greenhouse gas emissions responsible for 2 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is approximately 4.4% of all global net greenhouse gas emissions. That's like running 514 coal power stations. And the mechanisms this comes through is through unsustainable procurement and poor waste management, just to name a few. Here in this graph, you can see that there is a cataract surgery done in UK versus a cataract surgery done in India, Aravind. And the study showed that Aravind only emitted about 5% of the greenhouse gas of the same surgery done in UK. But in both of these surgeries, it was the unsustainable procurement that was a large component producing the greenhouse gas emissions. And that includes procurement of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals. On average, within healthcare, 71% of emissions are from the supply chain. Another mechanism is through poor waste management, which contributes to our carbon footprint. Although 85% of healthcare waste is non-hazardous, its disposable still has an impact in the environment. For example, non-contaminated healthcare plastic will still add to the plastic pollution if it is not recycled. Within eye health, there have been studies looking at the carbon footprint of cataract surgery. And I'll just briefly mention this here because I'm sure other talk uh, speakers will go more into detail, but basically the, the study showed that the same cataract surgery yielded 30 times more waste in UK versus um, the cataract surgery in India. These are just some examples to show that how we carry out our eye care activities can have a significant impact on the carbon emissions that we're producing. And in the last decade, we have seen a tremendous shift in energy globally to tackle climate change. There's really a strong momentum from the leading international agencies. For example, the United Nations has declared that climate change is a global emergency. There are 17 sustainable development goals, several of which are focused on the environment. And sustainable development goal 13 is specifically talking about climate action and taking action to combat climate change and its impact. The World Health Organization has stated that climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health, and they have a whole department dedicated to this. The Lancet Commission on Global Eye Health released last year a report saying that planetary health as a key component to improving quality of eye care, and they consider environmentally sustainable eye health services are needed to make progress towards the sustainable development goals. And finally, I want to mention that there is a growing body of movement that directors and boards of companies cannot continue to ignore the role they play 
in contributing to climate change, nor the risk that climate change poses to their workers, particularly as climate risks are linked to financial risk and the management of climate risk may impact the entity's ability to create long-term value for their shareholders. There are big shifts that are happening around us given the significant role we play in generating carbon emissions and the substantial impact climate change will have on our care, so we don't want to be left behind. But the good news is that we're not going to be left behind. There is already a lot of movement happening in the IK sector. We have the Climate Action Working Group that was established in 2017, and there's great interest from the sector. The goal of this working group is that we provide leadership and advocacy for the increased adoption and action of priority matters relating to climate action on our health for IIPB members and other stakeholders. The group now has 17 active members and that we meet regularly through the year. Last year, it was important that the sector declared a climate emergency. This was done during Earth Day. And this declaration really shows that the sector is committed and united to act on climate emergency. And we also have advocated and secured the endorsement of the UN resolution, which explicitly links eye health to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And now that they are linked, we can see that eye health has a link with environment as well. So what can we do now that we've talked about all this stuff that's happening? The Climate Action Working Group have produced and released a call to action for the environmentally sustainable practices in the eye health sector. And we've also looked, released the guide. So both these resources really show how, what are the key action areas that we can take to really do, uh, take steps within our organizations, within our workplaces to uh, reduce the impact we have. And now I'll just briefly mention the 10 key areas of action. But the guide and the call to action goes into a lot more detail. The first key action area is lead. Second is to advocate, procure sustainably, reduce the use of fossil fuels, conserve water, reduce and safely dispose of waste, reduce and green the travel, follow the four principles of sustainable clinical practice, embed environmental sustainability in education, and focus your research. So these are 10 key areas of action. What I wanna briefly do is to go through three areas and case studies of what's happening in the sector, just to give you an idea and taste of what possibly you could be doing in your workspace. The first key action area is LEAD. Here there is an organization that wants to recognize a climate emergency. So what the organization has done is taken organization wide steps. They looked at their project site, sites and they did an environmental impact assessment. Then they looked at the action, what actions they could do in, in terms of reducing their um, impact on the environment and they developed an action plan from that, both short-term and long-term. Then they implemented an environment policy which was done through an internal working group. So it really involved everyone within the organization. And then they also released a publication linking climate change and disability, which is another space that needs a lot more attention. Some of the key learnings that the organization has shared with us through this process is that they did need some input from experts, but they did use the organization for a lot of the work they did. They put targets that were realistic and they did things step by step. It wasn't all done at once. They got the buy-in from the colleagues within the company so that that they felt they were part of the process. And they really have the commitment of the CEO driving this whole agenda. And finally, they wanted to, they said they burn for it, which means everyone was committed and showed genuine interest in the cause. The second case study I wanna share with you is the area of reduce and safely dispose of waste. And the other speakers may speak a lot more on this. I just wanna uh, show you this little example that makes such a difference, which is such as Operation Theatre Waste. During the operation, a lot of waste can be generated. So the Aravind High Eye Hospital did a very simple intervention, which was to play co place color-coded biohazard waste bins within the operation theater. Here you can see in the picture, 
it's color coded depending on the type of waste will go into it. So during the surgery or after the operation, the waste was put into these bins, and then the waste was sent to the storage center and was uh, processed as it does weekly or fortnightly. But this simple intervention that was put in reduced the amount of waste that was going to a landfill. The third case study I want to share with you is around the key action area of following the four principles of sustainable clinical practice. About 54 million tonnes of electronic waste or e-waste is generated worldwide, and this is only going to grow faster and faster and larger. Global e-waste generation is projected to go to 75 million tonnes by 2030. Usually this is dumped in low to middle income countries where it's processed by women and children. And about 73 million children worldwide engage in this hazardous labor. The healthcare industry plays a part here. We have our medical devices, we have our office devices that you know once a new one comes out, we discard off. So one of the four principles is that we use medical procedure technologies with lower environmental impact. Before I go into a bit more detail, I'll just tell you what the other three principles are, which is lean eye health service delivery, which is minimizing wasteful resources at the health facilities and making it more integrated to avoid duplication and minimizing costs. Patient education empowerment, which is about really minimizing misunderstandings with patients, reducing the expense by the patient and less travel needed by the patient. And finally, disease prevention and health promotion. That's about reducing the use of resources in secondary and tertiary facilities, which tend to have a high impact on the environment and maximizing the care at the primary facility, which allows for quicker treatment, less burden on the health system and less travel and expense by patients. So back to the e-waste, this particular case study is looking at technology waste. So an organization got mobile phones, they decided that they would repurpose these discarded old mobile phones and um, refurbish them and repurpose them and build a camera with them. So they're trialing this in the primary care setting, which is another benefit, moving services primary that reduces the travel and cost of patients in the health system. So this is just another example. I think from these case studies, there's a few lessons I can share with you. Firstly, it's not an all or nothing initiative. We don't have to do everything, we can take small steps. The combined benefits are, include cost savings in many cases. So it's not just, okay, we do this environmental approach and we, it's gonna cost us a lot. In many uh, occasions, you might actually be saving money. And small changes can actually catalyze and to make larger changes, just like a ripple in the water, to make a big impact in the end. And finally, there's a lot of doom and gloom in climate change. Everything seems like it's the world is ending, you know, there's fires, floods. We still need to be hopeful that the small steps we take can make change. So going forward, if you want to get informed, you can download the guide from the IPB website and you can join the IPB mailing list to keep up to date with the key events and resources. You can also, if you're really interested, join our IPB Climate Action Work Group. And finally, just want to leave you with a quote for the Earth at the World Environment Day. In the universe, there are billions of galaxies. In the galaxy are billions of planets, but there is only one Earth. Let's take care of it. Thank you. And I can stop sharing now. So thank you, Matasha, for this uh, really um, high-level uh, presentation of uh, what's going on and uh, uh, what steps have been taken. Uh, I just want to ask one question before we move on to the next speaker. Sure. Uh, as with everything in the world, I think to the extent that we can uh, monitor and measure we can bring about change and improvement. And this is one area where this is uh, desperately needed. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on where we are. You now, one in terms of, suppose the individual practitioners want to do a 
you, you mentioned in one of the case studies, an impact assessment was done. Now, to, to do that in a consistent, comparable, benchmarkable manner, uh, that's one. And then uh, do we, uh, how close are we to have some kind of a measurement, you know, wherein we can, each of us can know, you know, we are making things worse, better, or improving. Do you, know, you have any thoughts on that or inputs on that, Matasha? Yeah, thank you, Tulsi, for asking this question. Um, so one of the key action areas is research. We need to focus our research a lot more. Um, right now, the research is quite limited in, in terms of exactly how much carbon is produced in what eye care activities they do. There are a few studies out there showing certain cataract surgeries, how much carbon is emitted. Um, more recently, clinical optometry practices in UK have shared how much carbon they produce. But I think there is really room for development of impact assessments within the eye care sector. We have an eye efficiency tool that's been being developed in the last few years and that's been trialled. And we're really hoping from the climate action work group perspective to really bring this to the forefront for the sector to be easily accessing it. Um, and of course, we need to understand how we practice our work, how, what kind of impact is ha it has for us to know if there's a difference. So I'm hoping that in the next new future, there will be better tools more accessible tools within the sector that can help us benchmark where we are at and if there's interventions being made through one of those key 10 action areas um, that we can then measure how we're performing against that. But in the meantime, I don't want people to feel discouraged that you know, they don't understand the impact um, or not, there's no great measuring tools out there that they still should do the little action areas that they're thinking of, recycling, repurposing, um, making uh, leaning, you know, their eye care service delivery, making more lean and efficient. Those simple measures will really help um, improve the, I guess, the contribution to climate change. Thanks, thanks, Patasha. So in the interest of time, we'll move on and I'm, I'm sure the audience would have some questions which we can uh, catch up later. So let me pass it back to uh, uh, Sri to introduce our next speaker. Shri, back to you. Thank you so much, both for the in-depth in -depth discussion. And actually, it's quite striking for me to understand, you know, especially in terms of the carbon footprint and the eye health sector, which is quite significant and worrisome both. So it is clear that we need to act fast and more importantly, act together. So yes. With that, we now move on to our next speaker, Dr. R. Venkatesh. Dr. Venkatesh is the Chief Medical Officer of Arvind Eye Hospital, Pondicherry. And he is also the Chief of the Glaucoma Services at Arvind Eye Hospital. Dr. Venkatesh has published uh, 70 research papers in peer-reviewed international journals, four publications in state journals, and has authored 10 book chapters so far. Apart from these, he has participated in various national and international meetings, combining the verticals of glaucoma, cataract and ophthalmology. Thank you for taking out time to share your knowledge and expertise, doctor. I will now hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Srikant. And also I take uh, this opportunity to thank for conducting this excellent uh, workshop. Um, so I, I, I'll be talking to you briefly in the next five minutes about how Arvind does low carbon eye care. Many of you would know Arvind started in 76 with 11 beds and now we have seven tertiary, seven secondary care centers, six community clinics and also 100 plus primary eye care centers or vision centers. So on a day we are dealing with a huge volume somewhere like 16 to 17,000 outpatients doing close to 2,000 surgeries, a lot of outreach activities. And also we are a model teaching a lot of people in ophthalmology, residency, fellows, technicians, administrators. So I think this, this is our moral responsibility to be sustainable for the environment again. So in, 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 uh, if you take this, I think we'll put it into two buckets in the, the general aspects and also into the service design. 
in general aspects like any other organization we have also focused on infrastructure alternate source of energy uh, consumable procurement uh, because we have our own manufacturing facility auto lab maintaining equipments uh, kind of rigorously so that the breakdown doesn't happen and the life of the equipments are extended and also we take care of other areas like water and food so when we talk about infrastructure and resources now all over at least the new buildings from pondicherry which was started in 2003 in the last 20 years we have kind of made it like more of a green building leveraging natural ventilation orientation so that you can minimize the solar heat and if you take this is our facility in chennai wherein you can see the ventilation on one side where the lights are off and the lights are on on the other half of the unit so wherever possible we have uh, done this to get a lot of uh, natural ventilation inside and the best part is we have housing for our staff within the campus in pondi tirupati chennai so that they don't have to travel to work and most of our hospitals now are uh, energy efficient at least 20 to 30 percent of the energy is through solar uh, panels which you see in all our hospitals and also in our manufacturing facility or lab we have done a lot of work on water management especially through our decentralized wastewater treatment system which almost uh, uh, recycles 90 percent of the water we use which is again used for toilet flushing and maintaining beautiful gardens which you see here in uh, pondicherry and also we engage our staff and patients mm-hmm. in water conservation and reducing the usage of water wherever possible so the, the most important part is getting into the service design and how we have designed the service to kind of uh, reduce reuse or multi use certain things carefully and also to recycle and repurpose we just briefly look at some of our areas what we do so if you see the patient flow in any i care facility i mean there are several stations like this but we have kind of designated one person to one task so that you have really highly skillful people doing that particular task and also we can attain a good quality and very optimally you use the resources especially the equipments and other resources in that particular area and also we have i cams and vision centers Uh, more like a hub and spoke model so that you now we are able to do video consultation with uh, a lot of patients on daily basis so this again significantly reduces the travel for example we saw close to 700000 patients through the 780 vision centers we had in 2020 now we have 100 plus but if you see only 15% were referred to the base hospital so 85% of patients were taken care of. otherwise these patients would have to travel for their care and also with their caregivers it would have significantly uh, increased the carbon footprint wherever possible we try to minimize the patient visits so we have lean clinical protocols with evidence we have standard operating procedures and if you take most of the uh, procedures would be taken care on the same day maybe a laser or an investigation like a a dye test or an oct scanning would be done on the same day a specialty opinion also would be completed on the same day and absolutely there is no waiting period for surgery anybody who is prepared for surgery is admitted and operated the next day the most important thing i think it's uh, it's to focus on the surgical protocols because the because of high cataract surgery which is the high volume surgery which happens across the globe and also in arvind so we follow stringent sterile protocols a lot of sharing of supplies happen and we also minimize the use of single use instruments by carefully reusing with very strict sterilization protocols for example we flash autoclave on a, a regular basis in between surgeries and at the end of the day it will be a full cycle and also the other important thing is waste segregation at generation point which helps us to really recycle waste this is a flow i think which you should all carefully see and also if you see uh, this is one of our uh, mid level ophthalmic personnel she is preparing the supplies for the morning so even if you see carefully the paper and the plastic are separated at source and they are kind of put into the dustbin which really helps you to recycle some of the waste so surgery dress and gown uh, at the end of the session it goes to cssd after washing and things 
the trace and at the end of the day, it will go to CSST. Eight to 10 surgical sets for each surgeon. In between every case, they will go to flash autoclave. End of the day, they will go for full cycle. Surgical gloves, uh, post-COVID, we have been disposing a glove for every patient, but normally we use for 10 patients and then we dispose a glove. And in between, we use uh, an antiseptic and syringes are disposed uh, at the end of every case. Sharps, needles and blades also disposed after every case into a biomedical waste puncture, cotton swabs and gauze, plastic drapes and packing material, which you saw here, are very carefully disposed and they are brought to a central area like this from where they go to a place where they go outside for sale. So by this, what we have found that, you know, the, the waste which we uh, generate is significantly lower than what happens in most of the European and also in US, in developed world which is equivalent to driving a car 25 kilometers. Now the carbon footprint is 20 times more in the Western world. So this again, we gave a lot of evidence in literature to share that our carbon footprint of FACO is 20 times in, is higher in US and UK when compared to what happens in Aravind. At the same time, our infection rates in Aravind is four times lower than so you have less waste and also less infection rates. So what are we doing really by achieving a lot of uh, uh, things which is used only once during surgery? So this is uh, a, a picture again, which uh, Mitasha also showed. Uh, this is one FACO case in uh, US where I had several of these pictures when I go to US. And this is like 100 cases uh, in our list. Now, even today we had 110 FACOs and the waste would be something like this at the end of the OR. During COVID time, we also took interest to see because can we, we were following some of the Western standards. So we wanted to see whether it makes any difference. Like for example, uh, we were uh, cleaning the OR after every case. So what you see in the left side is pre-COVID and this is during the COVID time. So here, normally the patients are not gone. You use every 10th case, you change a glove. Floors are not clean between case and multiple patients underwent preparations and surgery, like two table system. And during COVID time, we gown the patient. We change gloves for every patient and our floors and counters were clean between the patients. And there was only one patient at a, any given point of time in the OR, something like the Western standards. And we looked at is there any difference in infection rates or anything else? There was absolutely no difference and it was the same. And we got it published so that people would be aware of all this. So I think the most important thing, uh, which I'm sure uh, people would cover in their pres other presentations also, there is a high level of commitment from the leadership to be environmentally sustainable. There's a lot of staff engagement. And also at Pondicherry, we do this patient awareness. We have this green tour happening every day for the caregivers of our daycare patients. So they are taken by one of our volunteers around the facility to show them what we really do to be environmental sustainable so that we engage our patients or the customers also. And we try to look for new ideas and wherever we find opportunities, we try to implement it. And uh, as a result, now it has become like the organization's DNA to be low carbon. Thank you. And I would, if people are interested, this is an excellent facility or a website called isustain.org, which is developed by the uh, ASCRS. And this really gives you a lot of information about uh, how to calculate the waste and how to be sustainable in small practice or in big institutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Venkatesh, for that uh, excellent uh, insight into what uh, each healthcare provider could do. Uh, I would just like to ask uh, a couple of questions uh, before we move on to the next speaker. Uh, two things. Can you talk a little bit about the role of technology and reducing carbon footprint? Because that would be a low-hanging fruit. Uh, and the second one is that uh, the way you described, it was very clear that every member of your organization, the entire staff 
was also engaged in this process. So how did that come about? It is, it is uh, clearly wouldn't have been possible as a one man uh, putting pressure and getting this done. It could not have happened. So can you touch on these two briefly? One thing in, in technology, especially when we started using the electronic medical record, now we are actually working on evidence for that also, which will be soon in print. We have seen a significant reduction of usage of paper uh, and other related stationaries which you use normally, the storage and uh, how to have a space for that and a lot of carbon footprint related to that. But definitely on the other side, you have electric electricity and computer and systems, but still we found that there is a significant reduction by using a electronic medical record in a health system uh, in reducing carbon footprint. The second way technology really helps, uh, especially in our model is where we do a lot of telemedicine uh, through our vision center. So, so that's where I touched upon almost 85% uh, of the care can be done if we have a very good telemedicine unit, wherein a technician at the vision center is able to resolve the problems and only 10-15% who really need surgery or kind of procedures and lasers would be referred to a base hospital. Uh, and, and of course, a lot of other areas where if you really take care of the technology, you know, the, especially the medical technology, which are very expensive by having a robust equipment maintenance, you know, which uh, I, I couldn't focus in my talk because it's, it's very important that if you, if you can really take care, do preventive maintenance on a regular basis, you can prevent the breakdown happening of these equipments and the life of these equipments can be extended significantly so that we don't have to kind of condemn these uh, uh, high expensive machines in a quite frequent intervals. So these are the, some of the areas where I think I'll touch upon technology. And the other question is getting the DNA into the system. I, I, I think uh, 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 culturally, uh, you know, it, it comes, you know, where uh, you are a more frugal organization, you are thinking of frugality, uh, you don't throw away a bed sheet, uh, which is kind of condemned. You know, you see whether how you can repurpose that bed sheet into a pillow cover and things like that. So our staff are somewhere engaged in that kind of a repurposing activity. So they think twice before throwing off anything. And now they understand, you now when we talk about solar energy and conserving electricity, even during COVID time, now what we learned was, do we really need screen for our windows? Do we really need that? You know, in daytime, you always keep it open and then you put a screen and then your uh, lights are on. Now, once you bring in the daylight inside, you don't even need those lights somewhere in our clinics and outpatient areas. So I think some of these things, when they repurpose and the organization is also frugal, thinking of uh, ideas and opportunities, somewhere it gets into the DNA of every staff. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesh. Yeah, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll hand, over, hand it back to Sri to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Tulsiraj, and thank you, uh, Dr. Venkatesh, for that wonderful presentation. It is amazing to learn that on one side, patient safety is not compromised, but at the same time, you know, we're not causing any harm to the environment. So it's wonderful. Kudos for all the efforts taken out by Arvind. Great. I would like to now invite our next speaker, Mr. Manoj Kumar. Mr. Manoj is an engineering leader with more than three decades of professional engagement in the government and corporate sector. He is an associate director and an energy management consultant at the LV Prasad I Institute. With his long association and expertise in the power sector, it has become his passion to promote and build sustainable energy solutions, especially in solar renewable energy. Over to you, Mr. Manoj. Mr. Manoj, you're on mute, actually. Oh, thanks for alerting, Srikant. I am audible now? Yeah, yes. yeah, we can hear you and see the yeah. slide, yeah. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, uh, for giving this uh, wonderful platform for all of us to come together and uh, brainstorm on what is happening around us and uh, what could be done going forward. So this kind of a need is uh, definitely more than what one can imagine. 
like already the previous speakers have touched upon that i'll uh, directly get into uh, what i would like to share from uh, nb prasad i institute's perspective what is it we are doing towards this initiative uh, to take care of the climate uh, related uh, uh, activities that is really very concerning so can we move on to the next slide uh, yeah so just to give a picture why we are talking so much about the climate change and its impact this picture speaks a ton about that you can see the glaciers are melting down faster and there are unseasonal uh, extreme weather conditions whether it is uh, forest fires or cyclonic effects or overheat conditions like uh, prasi just mentioned and the uh, kind of uh, flooding that you can see in most of the places all over or the kind of uh, damage to the agricultural uh, cycles all these are nothing less than the kind of a warning bell why this climate change has to be attended to without really ignoring that that is the need of the hour i would say next slide are we really uh, i mean can you be yeah. are we really going to do something from our side towards that is a question that one has to ponder upon ourselves whether we are a i care sector or an individual uh, hospital whatever it is can we do something about it that's a question we have to really address very seriously next slide so here i have listed out what is few of those areas what lb prasad institute has been uh, embarked upon towards this initiative are listed here so some of them are already been very beautifully covered in the previous speakers uh, how arvind is doing and mitasha has touched on the iapbs initiatives as well so i have put it under 10 different activities what we have been doing in the last few years under the green lvp initiative topping this list is the renewable energy then we are also doing how to reuse the water that is available so all these resources are scarce and how best we can really use them is a area where we need to then third is about the conservation can we do something about conserving these most precious resources then is there any possibility for recycling some of these activities within our own campuses then again how to reduce some of these uh, consumables and other uh, supplies what we day in day out use in the uh, i care sector of course the next is the buildings can we make it more efficient in all aspects that is also looked into then uh, can we make really our campuses more closer to nature than building more concrete jungles so that is the next area where we need to start looking into and uh, apart from that we are also into the responsible waste disposal as well as uh, awareness creation and last but not least the electronic and mobile services next slide so here within the renewable space what we have done so far is we have covered uh, 24 centers of lv prasad the uh, hospitals in the tertiary and secondary centers with the uh, rooftop solar and uh, annually we could able to generate 1500 megawatt hours of power which is equal to saving 50000 trees which is a phenomenal number in terms of the action that we could able to yeah, generate out of this initiative and uh, it is also helping the most important uh, take away for the purpose is what is need for me forget about the climate change impacts and other thing is a huge cost saving so a yearly we could able to save 150 lakhs of the cost that otherwise we spent to pay to electric departments where they use the fossil fuels it's another reason why we can think of a rooftop solar next slide please move on yeah then the second aspect where we looked into is uh, water conservation so we have introduced the rain water harvest filters you can see in the first picture which is circled here in all the hospitals uh, we do have a lot of uh, rain water that is otherwise getting directly connected to the drain system so what we are doing is we are uh, getting this uh, water filtered and making that to reuse either for gardening purpose or for plumbing activity i mean uh, flushing activities in the toilets etc so this particular initiative we have just started recently the good news is that with one filter what you can see in this picture at least uh, 5000 liters of water is saved if we have 25 mm rainfall in an hour's time so that is phenomenal why i say so is even in summers within n2 preserve the campuses in some places we have to depend upon water tankers it is not only saving our money every water tanker of 10 to 15000 liters uh, they charge anywhere around 2000 to 3000 rupees 
Here, because of this rainwater harvest filters, around 5,000 liters of water we could save. So you can understand how the economics also works in our favor. The image on the right side is the uh, sewage treatment plant. In almost all of our uh, secondary centers also, now we started going for this STP plants. You can see here it is a very compact design and they are uh, very portable and uh, ready-made units are available these days, which are cost effective also. So these things are going to help uh, across the LVP network. So far we have 500 uh, KLD capacity uh, STPs installed so far. It is equal to 300,000 liters of water that is being recycled. So this is another wonderful way we can think of how can uh, we can save the water, which is another precious resource, otherwise which we are otherwise ignoring in most of the cases. Next slide. Can we move? Yeah. Then saving of water is equally important. So what we started recently as an experimental basis is, as you can see in the left side, there is a small uh, add-on gadget that is available in the market. By just inserting this in most of the taps are uh, universally able to adopt this kind of an insert. We can able to save so much of water, almost 1200 liters per tap per month can be saved by this add-on gadget. And if you see the cost, we are just investing 150 rupees, but we could able to save more than 1200 liters in one tap. That is phenomenal. The images on the right side is uh, taken from one of the installations where we have done. The image on the left side is the one without that uh, add-on gadget and the right one is the one after putting the gadget. If you see most of the wash basins, hardly we use the entire water once we turn the tap on, whether it is auto closed uh, tap or whatever it is. This is where this kind of saving is going to help us because every trickle of water we are able to save in this small intervention. Next slide. So then continuing on the saving part, what we are doing is most of our electrical uh, gadgets over a period of time, we are going through a phasing out in terms of going for five star rated air conditioner units, replacing the conventional CFLs and the tube lights with uh, LEDs. With these things, we have seen and measured more than 20% of energy costs are saved. And the next is on the, uh, we have put a uh, coat as you can see on the image on the right side. This is a roof coating which we have checked physically. After applying this coat of paint on the surface, 25 degrees of surface temperature has come down. You can see what impact it can make for the running of ACs below that floor. The same terrace is pictured before the coating on the bottom side. And after the coating, this is a reflection what you see, wherein the sunlight, the heat is not getting absorbed into the building. 25 degrees of uh, heat is again going back into the atmosphere rather than absorbed by the building. Thereby that much of reduction in your air conditioning and the cooling costs that can be achieved with the help of this kind of a intervention. Then the same image also speaks about the solar water heaters. So across our campuses, we have put uh, 10,000 LPD capacity of uh, water heaters. Most of our hostels are equipped with these water heaters, wherein we could eliminate the conventional geysers. So thereby we could save a lot of energy for heating the water. Next slide, please. This uh, another intervention which we recently started is in every campus where a lot of footfalls are there, we automatically end up generating so much of waste either from the food, uh, pre-cooked food or uh, the raw material that is used in the food. So as you can see, this is a very simple cost effective intervention what we did on a pilot basis. We started yielding very wonderful results. What we started doing is connect this uh, food waste like the peels of uh, food and uh, dry leaves from the uh, campuses and start putting them in these kind of drums and add some manure into that, nothing but the cow dung and other thing. And within three months time, it is completely transformed into this kind of a reusable vermi compost. So this is also a very cost effective solution. Next slide. We started uh, going to uh, make a lot of noise around uh, reusing the water bottles and the water glasses instead of single time use glasses and cups. It has started giving wonderful results. But because of the COVID pandemic in patient care areas, we continue to use these paper cups. But for the, all the staff and the other areas where it is possible, like the conference rooms, we have moved to completely replace all the one-time use plastics and uh, paper cups with steel bottles and copper water bottles. 
and most of our meetings are today thanks to covid related restrictions it is happening virtually like we are all connecting today and also we have minimized the use of printing and the paper in wherever there is possibility next slide this is a signature uh, most of our hospitals whoever has visited us we believe in reducing the concrete uh, blocks and believe more in nature these are all images taken from our campuses uh, here in hyderabad so you can see the building space is less than 25% in across the campuses 75% it is greenery it means a lot for protecting the nature next slide couple of more slides to end then i leave the floor open so this also some of you had already seen and heard about it so this is a, a very grown tree that was available in our headquarters when there was an expansion going to happen we had either to cut down this tree and forget it then we chosen to replant it so what we did is this entire tree at the same size has been transported to other campus in hyderabad and the image on the right side uh, is a true image that is being captured the tree has able to again revive without giving any kind of damage to the life of that plant so this is what we do protecting the nature wherever possible next slide waste handling has been spoken at length uh, by my previous speaker so at the source all the waste gets segregated so that there is no kind of uh, uh, hazards at the same time we take care of the importance of segregating them and properly disposing them and uh, our effort is to tie up with those kind of uh, waste handlers who are using these different kinds of waste for proper recycling so that journey just we have started so in the coming times we could able to speak more on how we could able to achieve the desired results in this area next slide so we continue to do lot of awareness campaigns because this journey doesn't stop and start with some individuals in the organization it is equally important that everybody can contribute in this initiative which is very very important need of the hour so we do lot of campaigns in all our campuses how to take care of the water and precious uh, resources of the nature and this is happening in all our campuses as a standard protocol next slide this is also one another initiative to minimize the use of one time use plastic and replace them with the jute bags which are actually been uh, done by uh, manufactured by our rehab uh, patients so thereby it's a win win situation to replace one time plastic with multi use uh, jute bags uh, so even the rehabilitation uh, people also get an opportunity for their uh, livelihood next so last slide where i would like to touch upon the electronic and uh, mobile services electronic medical records are uh, most of the uh, matured i hospitals are already doing this so we are also doing in full fledged manner and uh, the, after this covid this connect care has become a very major initiative where the tele ophthalmology video consultations and uh, medical reports being shared on uh, electronic form and appointments uh, have been taken through electronically rather than personally coming is happening across the campuses and uh, eye smart application we could connect all the 230 plus visual uh, vision centers also with our headquarters so a lot of patients uh, could minimize their need to come to the uh, higher care uh, hospitals for their needs and digital education has become a common uh, need uh, option these days for connecting all the education using the digital platform and on the mobile services we have recently launched something called pashyantu where the glaucoma and advanced eye care facilities are made available at the secondary eye care centers also where these diagnostics are available with the help of this pashyantu mobile uh, medical diagnostic vans and the doctors will be available in those secondary centers to extend their expert advice and treat the patient then and there itself so these are the few initiatives where uh, we have been done so much of progress next slide please so i would say that this journey has just started it has to really go miles long then only we can sit back and tell yes we are doing our bit to take care of the climate uh, change impact last slide can we move on so this is just to summarize what we have been speaking if we take care of the planet through our whatever small big initiatives what you can see in the right side of the image this is how we can take care of our planet earth if we continue to ignore or not really pay attention not pay heed to the need of the hour we are going to definitely leave a very bad situation 
for the coming generations. So our humble submission is that whether we are an individual practitioner or an institution uh, who are having this kind of uh, healthcare services, there are ways and means where we cannot do contribute for mitigating the climate change. Thank you once again. Uh, so I would uh, hang on for any specific questions uh, from the audience. <clears throat> Uh, uh, thank you, Manoj, for that uh, uh, brilliant description of what's happening in uh, LV Prasad. Uh, before we move to the next speaker, one quick question. Uh, LVP is a, is a huge network, you know, probably the largest network of eye care providers in the country. You know, you're spanning, I think, three states, uh, maybe more. Uh, and probably in about 250 or locations, including mission centers. So given that, how, how, how are you kind of scaling this across the entire network? Uh, and then also what kind of a monitoring mechanism do you have that it is uh, sustaining and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, getting into the uh, system? You know? So, yeah. Thank you, Tulsi, for this uh, question. So out of the 264 centers, a combination of vision centers, secondary centers, tertiary centers, our primary goal as far as uh, solar renewable is concerned, our goal is by 2022-23 financial year, we would like to cover all the secondary centers. Tertiary centers are already covered. As it stands while we are talking, 70% of our secondary centers also are having solar rooftop. By end of this financial year, we would like to cover the remaining 30% also. When in terms of the actual uh, impact of the total power that is drawn across all our campuses, as it stands today, 37% of this energy requirements are made by the solar power. And our aim, once we cover the remaining 30% of secondary centers, we could able to meet 50% is the target what we have benchmarked for ourselves. When we say this, it is also helping in terms of the cash flow situation, as I have uh, mentioned in my first slide. Uh, within four years, we have seen that whatever capital we are investing. Uh, by the way, I want to say here that all of our solar investments are completely CapEx model. We have invested for the entire cost. And uh, what we have seen is within four years, we could be able to recover the entire investment uh, from the savings that has been accrued by the solar roof. So this is the same model we will continue for some more time until and unless uh, we are thinking of either a kind of a open access system for meeting our Banjara Hills main headquarters requirement. Uh, until that point in time, we are not open uh, considering OPEX model. And uh, second is, apart from this, the rainwater harvest systems or the STPs, this is also being targeted that we will definitely reach out to all our up to the secondary center level. At this point in time, we are not looking at the vision centers because when we looked into the vision center model, we are ready to see that the kind of an operational efficiencies and the value creation with the help of some of these initiatives, it could take some more time before we can really reach up to the vision care uh, model. I hope I answered your question. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Got a sense of, yeah. So, so back to you, Sri, uh, for the next speaker. Thank you so much, Mr. Manoj, for taking us through the incredible journey of LV Prasada Institute and its green initiatives. <laughs> Our next speaker for today is Dr. Rajesh Saini. Dr. Rajesh Saini is the Chief Executive Officer of Siliguri Greater Lions Eye Hospital that focuses on bringing quality eye services through its network of tertiary, secondary, and primary eye care centers. <coughs> He has more than 10 years of working experience in the eye care hospital management and is a life member of Academy of Hospital Administration and is also a member of Asian Society of Quality in Healthcare. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Rajesh. Thank you. Thank you, Shrikant. Thank you very much. I'll share my slide now. I hope it's visible. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Rajesh. Yes. So thank you very much. First, uh, gratitude to Mission for Vision for organizing this lovely webinar. Uh, I will be presenting uh, Siliguri Greater Lions Eye Hospital initiatives, green energy initiatives to achieve the environment sustainability. As a lot of things already said by our previous speakers, so I will share the experience of Siliguri Greater Lions Eye Hospital in terms of sustainable development goals already a lot of things spoken. 
but yes uh, goal number 17 partnerships are important to achieve all the goals so with the partner initiative our orbis initiative we started this green vision center initiative obviously the goal is to provide primary ik services with environment sustainability we all agree that a uh, considerable portion of population is uh, not able to access the healthcare services due to multiple reasons and one of the reason is obviously lack of continued electrical supply at the rural and the remote places so we came with this concept with orbis and this concept is really about providing uninterrupted electrical supply through solar panels providing a digital solution so that we reduce the paper waste and energy efficient appliances so to address this the lack of access poor patient and clinical data management and interruptions in functioning this green vision center strategy adoption done by orbis we adopted this strategy at 10 vision centers out of this 10 four vision centers are complete vision centers with the three solutions we mentioned solar energy uh, energy efficient devices and the energy uh, the software the electronic software to do the data management and the rest six are only uh, been taken care of with the data management solution so considering the following points obviously the convenient location optimal platform for screening patients provide remedial measures timely referrals use of data management software possibility less consumption of paper use of leds and less power consuming equipments and renewable solar systems at primary eye care centers the use of solar energy we all have understood that a conventional electricity has got a lot of side effects related to greenhouse gases and uh, combustion so the alternative energy source is the solar which we installed at the four of the primary eye care centers this is a digital solution we installed uh, called icom a integrated community outreach model few of the images that how the real time and the data entry has been done and connected to the base hospital uh, installation pictures at the base hospital uh, at the vision center so few of the green vision center attributes and hypothesis to understand what are the benefits at the primary eye care level so if we if we install 10 vision green vision center 10 megawatt of electricity generated from the conventional source can be replaced 94% reduction in the carbon emission as against a regular vision center four to five trees saved by every 10 vision, green vision centers per year due to reduced usage of paper when it is connected through a software technology there is 25% increase in the productive time obviously when there is uninterrupted supply of electricity the productivity productivity will increase and also there is 10% increase in the increase in the patient footfall and this all data we have monitored through a considerable time period and still it's going on obviously 100% reduction in the electricity expenses of the vision centers 76% reduction in the expenses towards the management of medical records because we are connected through a digital system the new initiative again with the initiative of orbis we have initiated use of e bikes at two of our vision center which are again these green vision centers using of e bikes by our health workers who are going to the community and doing the door to door screening and also school screenings so these health workers they travel by these e bikes and these e bikes are again charged at these green vision centers through, through that solar power next steps we move on to again the benefit for the solar energy we move to the solar panel at our unit 1 base hospital which is a 100 kilowatt solar energy plant we have installed the planning is being done in a way that the 25 years period the solar energy will give a solar 25 years period of warranty guarantee period for the electricity generation and there is a minimal charge of 30000 per year amc which we need to bear and the principle as uh, talked by manoj ji we, we in our system we are assuming that in 6 years period of time we will completely recover the principal cost what we have invested in the solar energy rooftop 100 kilowatt so if we if we analyze this in in terms of payback period or cost benefit analysis for an entire year we see that in in a span of 6 years we will completely recover this cost of investment in the solar energy 
And after that, there will be a complete savings in terms of electricity for the eye hospital. We need to consider that every five to eight or 10 years, the electricity charges per unit will also go up. So this saving is calculation is at present uh, according to the present rates. Uh, solar energy, it's been obviously an understanding in between the hospitals or between the management, it is not easy, it's, it's a costly affair. Yes, we also went through a lot of brainstorming and then uh, I'm not promoting SBI or Tata Solar, but at present Tata Solar and SBI, I think they have joined hands, what we have uh, went through. And they are providing schemes to uh, fund this to the hospitals who want to have the uh, solar panels and they provide at a decent interest rate and some subsidy also. So uh, 50 to 60 kilowatt, according to the size of the hospital, capacity of the hospital, hospitals can install minimum 50 to 60 kilowatts. The result would be obviously there will be protection against the electricity bill. There will be handsome return on investment from a period of first year to 25 years. Yes, we will contribute to the environment sustainability with reduced CO2 emissions and reduced tree, uh, deforestation. And obviously in the first year, we can get the tax depreciation benefit through this solar investment as per the law of government. I will end my presentation with this statement, without environmental sustainability, economic stability and social cohesion cannot be achieved. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rajesh. Uh, I think you focused a lot on uh, uh, green energy, you know, going towards uh, solar energy. Uh, maybe if you can touch briefly upon the, you, you, you cover the investment part. You know? So I think one question that uh, many of us would have is uh, how about ongoing maintenance and support and uh, that sort of a thing. You know, is, is that an issue or is it, um, uh, or, or how are you managing or dealing with it? So when we did for the vision center, sir, uh, with the company, we did the deal that it will be covered for two years warranty. First two years was covered in the warranty. And after that, we have taken AMC. And in addition, we have trained one manpower who is our biomedical engineer to maintain the systems. And the routine maintenance of the solar panels and to manage the fluids uh, at the solar indicators, it's done by the vision center team only. At the base hospital, again, we have gone for a two years warranty. It's still in the first six months, uh, but we look forward that there will be a AMC, which is 30,000 per year, which will pay to the company to maintain the systems. So, 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 so you would have a protocol for cleaning the panels periodically because uh, yes, yes, everything yes. Would, would reduce the, yes. the every quarter, every quarter, the company has committed that every quarter, their person will come and do a visit and do the needful. Okay. Okay. So internally, you are not doing any maintenance in terms of cleaning on a weekly at present, basis. It's, it's, at the hospital level, it's still new for us, sir. We, we okay. need to see how it goes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rajesh. Yeah. That's a, that is a good input. So, so uh, back to you, Shri, for the next speaker. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Rajesh. That was quite inspiring to hear. Uh, we now move on to our next speaker for today. Mr. Shivkumar Lakshman. Mr. Shivkumar leads the thousand member strong Renusis Hyderabad division. A believer in taking on challenges with pragmatism, he does not shy from rolling up his sleeves and pitching in. He has honed these values in a career spanning three decades in industries as diverse as advertising, packaging, chemical trading, and renewables in job profiles ranging from sales to operations. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm certain that the audiences are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Over to you, Mr. Shivkumar. Thank you, Shrikan. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me at, and Renewsus to make a small presentation here and share our views about renewables. It's also encouraging to see that uh, already the participants here have adopted renewables. And uh, it also gives us the confidence that we should expand more. Uh, so I'll just take you through our presentation. Please let me know whether uh, it's visible. Yeah, we can see it now. Yes. Great. So uh, thank you once again. Let me start the presentation.
That's not moving ahead. First, uh, just click on your uh, mouse, sir. Yeah. Okay. I got yeah. that. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Renews is part of the uh, NP group, and Renews is an integrated, the first integrated manufacturer of solar PV modules in India. We also make key components like encapsulants and back sheets and solar cells. We have operations, uh, we have three factories, one in Bangalore, which makes the components. And uh, in Hyderabad, we, and Patalganga, which is in the outskirts of Bombay, we manufacture modules and solar cells. We also are uh, uh, into community outreach where we have tied up with Vision for Mission and uh, we have uh, done some uh, projects with them. Uh, we also have provided PP kits uh, for 21 eye hospitals uh, tied up with Vision Mission. Uh, we are, as uh, it, on the right hand side, you can see that uh, we have a capacity. I don't know how many of you will follow the capacities, but we have about 1.5 gigawatt capacity of module manufacturing, and we have about 400 megawatt capacity of PV cells and 18 gigawatt of back sheets. Uh, we were the first integrated manufacturer, and of course, now we have more players in the market. We are also expanding. We belong to the NP group, uh, which was established in 1961. Uh, we have close to 4,000 plus employees working with us. Um, we have about six odd manufacturing plants based in Nigeria, which is where we started our uh, journey. And in India, we have Renuces, which is into manufacturing, purely into manufacturing. Uh, these are some of our group values. And to give you a perspective of who our customers are, uh, they are some of the large developers and EPC players in the market. So why go solar? I think you've already seen in the previous presentations uh, the advantages solar brings onto the table and why renewable is very important. Though coal is still leading, uh, we see a lot of uh, 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 a lot of people going towards solar, maybe because the cost has come down. Uh, a few years back, the cost was as, as high as 15 rupees per unit. Today, the cost has come down to as low as uh, 2 to 3 rupees per unit. And that has really encouraged people to get onto this bandwagon. So we are today at about 39% renewable energy and with which solar is at 13.2%. Uh, in the last year itself, uh, about 10 gigawatt of solar installations took place in the country. And uh, we have a cumulative capacity of 50 gigawatt. The government has set up some steep targets. They want to get to close to 350 gigawatt in the next few years. And I think a lot of uh, large corporates are also getting onto the solar uh, investments, and you will see this increasing year on year. One of the great great things about solar is that uh, it has minimal investments, minimal maintenance. Uh, there are no moving parts, and it's a long project uh, lifespan. As Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Rajesh mentioned, that you know this solar once you install can give you a lifespan of about twenty five years plus. So and your recovery could be in the range of about four to five years, the like recovery of investment. And it's also great for the environment. Now, uh, this basically tells you what is solar power and how it works. So what you see here is basically uh, solar power is nothing but it's a silica cell, which is converted into a solar cell, which converts the sunlight into electricity. And then this electricity, electricity is captured and it uh, gets passed on to your inverter and then finally to the consumer. It could be a household, it could be an industry, CNI, or it could be a large power project. Where this, uh, uh, and basically, you can see here is how a solar panel is manufactured or what are the components. Uh, some of the key components is aluminum frame, uh, glass, uh, you have encapsulants and the key component being solar cells, which uh, which basically consists of about 65% of a solar cell, the cost of a solar cell. And these are some of the 
installations and across uh, in India and outside India. Uh, we have done a lot of projects. We have sold uh, more than a gigawatt plus of solar panels since we started operations here in Hyderabad. And this is to give you a little perspective about what kind of connections are available. Uh, we have an on-grid connection, which you're aware of is basically is connected to the power grid and uh, you can draw the energy, you can sell the energy to the grid and then you can draw energy from there for your consumption. An off-grid is basically you generate the energy and you store and use it uh, when there's a requirement. And uh, in terms of ownership, yes, you can have your own plant and you can generate your own power or you can buy power from PPA, private purchase agreements. And there are other, a lot of new options which are coming up. So this basically is a very short presentation from Renewsys. I think you all are quite familiar with renewables. I also take this opportunity to invite anybody who's interested in visiting our factory, which is in Hyderabad. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shokumar, for that uh, brief uh, but informative uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so, 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 like you said, the the uh, solar power to, to start with was sort of not financially viable. No, so the that's right. Uh, uptake was low, and and uh, now now you say it's much more uh, affordable. So, which way is it heading? You no, know, going forward. Uh, 10 years from now, do you have any uh, prediction on both costs and on also on uh, efficiency? You know, today, yeah, one kilowatt probably produces between uh, maybe three to four uh, watts per day. You know, uh, would the efficiency also be uh, improving? So what's happening in the industry is when uh, we started off in 2008, when the industry took steam and uh, got off the ground, uh, like I said, the cost of unit was close to 15 rupees per unit. And at that time, the solar panels which were available was in the range of about 200 watt peak, 150 watt peak to 200 watt peak. Today, we have graduated to uh, solar panels as we speak. Right now, we are selling solar panels for a watt peak of 550 in the market. So basically, due to the uh, change in technology and due to the uh, uh, evolution that has happened, the cost has also come down. And more and more uh, players have come into the market, more and more manufacturing is happening. Capacities have been added, which has brought the cost down from say 15 rupees to closer to two to three rupees. And to answer your question, where we are going to be 10 years down the line, you will see there will be more adaptability and adoptability for solar. Uh, the only drawback could be availability of land or availability of roof space. But I'm sure with the increase in size of panels, uh, you will find that, and there are a lot of new concepts coming into the market. You'll fi find that more and more people will come onto this. And the cost may remain same or it may go down a bit, but we are not likely to see a major change below two rupees. I think it has already reached its bottom. Uh, because uh, with the technology changes happening, cost of manufacturing is also going up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I think in the interest of time, I think we should move on, uh, Sri. I think we are into the um, uh, Q and A. Uh, do we have any Q for the A? Yes, we do have a lot of questions coming through. Okay. Uh, the first question is for Mitasha. Uh, the first question is around how can organizations engage our communities and patients in our efforts to protect the environment? So this is primarily towards the behavior change angle of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shri, and thank you for the person that asked that question. Um, so firstly, I think it's important that we understand within, if it's within the organisation trying to make the change or with your partner, that you help them understand why this is important. What, what is the link between eye care or the workspace you're doing and climate change? They are like most people, they might think it's foreign, it's not relevant for them. So you need to really show them why it's important and what the link is. And then you should also think about advocating the benefits of doing something about it. Um, like I mentioned, and the other speakers have mentioned, you know, saving costs is a major benefit that comes out of implementing some of these interventions, whether it's uh, reducing the energy use, conserving water, repurposing uh, discarded uh, technologies, those kinds of things, they all have some sort of combined benefit. And I think um, all those 
steps if you do that. You can also then um, bring people around and get them engaged from, from the start, talking from the beginning. With any development work, we, if you have buy-in from the start, people will feel more engaged. And finally, I think then you can suggest interventions. Start off with small interventions. So they might not have the budget to install, you know, pan, solar panels or something, you know, like a water sanitation system, something more simple like, turning off the lights when you're not using them, little simple interventions like that. Um, I think people can get on board much more easily and there's that sort of step progresses through that. I think those are some key steps you can take to start engaging. Great, I think it's all about the small steps that take us to a bigger picture. That's right, Wonderful. thank you. Great, our next question is for Dr. Venkatesh. So could you please share some good practices that are followed by the Arvind Eye Care System, vision centers particularly, apart from teleophthalmology? And also the second part of the question is about uh, the training needs of the VC staff in these vision centers. Okay. So the, uh, the, our vision center model, the, we, we actually engage our own staff who have been working with us. Uh, they are called the mid-level ophthalmic personnel. And most of them are optometrists trained, you know, who have a certificate course on doing uh, optometry services. So basically, we engage two staffs. One is like a counselor who manages the registration and also the dispensing part of it, the optical and medical. The other person is the optometrist who does the investigations and the telemedicine with the doctor. So most of them are trained at Aravind. They have been working for a few years. And they moved uh, to the vision center because it was closer to their hometown or it was the same village where they came from. Or because of the need in that place, we would have posted them there and they're living there with the family. So it's a kind of win-win for both. After some time when they are married, when they have children, uh, they can't come to the base hospital for work. Uh, the time is more office hours there. No, it starts at 8.30 and closes at 4.35. So it's kind of win-win where we get our staff who are already well-trained and then they, they have an opportunity to work in the same place where they come from so that uh, uh, they also do a better care uh, for their own people where they come from. And the training is same. You know what? In addition to their regular optometry course or whatever they've done, when they, before they go to EMR, six months we train them uh, in before they go to vision center in uh, doing electronic medical record, fundus imaging, few things which they normally don't do. We, we give them a part-time training and then we post them there. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Tulsiraj, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, yeah. to supplement on the uh, 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 on this particular topic of reducing carbon footprint, uh, I think we have done a few things uh, on an experiment. Uh, in turn of our vision centers, we've done a detailed audit and then the first thing we did was to see where all we can reduce the power consumption. I think that's a no-brainer, actually. You know, uh, from everything, from street lamps to computers, to in everything, you can shave off you know, 10, 20 percent power consumption. So that's the first thing we did. Uh, and then in all this stand, we have also uh, installed uh, uh, solar you know, to, to, to have this green energy. Uh, so now we are in the scaling up uh, phase. Uh, and then recognizing that in, in all the hospitals, the vision centers tend to be rented premises. So there are some uh, practical uh, issues that we will need to take care of in terms of uh, uh, getting the permits and uh, permission and things like that from the, from the house owner. So that's where uh, uh, things are. Uh, and then constantly, this has got a very indirect impact on the carbon footprint. Uh, making sure that you are improving compliance. You, know, you, you prescribe something, they buy it or use it, or you, you refer someone to uh, go to the hospital. Because the flip side of non-compliance is that all the effort that went up to that point of time becomes waste. And anything that's wasted is, I think, 100% adding to the carbon footprint. No, uh, because it, we have to put in effort. And if the effort is not resulting in what it should, uh, then it really equates to I mean, a lot of waste. And even from the carbon uh, lens, it again becomes a waste. No? So uh, we, we bring in an excessive focus on uh, managing and improving compliance. 
know, all those things add up. It's wonderful. Great. Uh, so we do have a flurry of questions coming in right now. Uh, so I'll quickly skim through and try and answer as many as possible. Uh, next question is to uh, Mr. Manoj. Uh, keeping the staff across the system aligned to this purpose could be a challenge. How does LVPI address this? Yeah, it's a very important question. Uh, thanks for uh, asking this uh, from the audience. See, primarily, I would say that from our experience, uh, how we tackled it is, uh, uh, it's all with the proper planning. So we understand what is the limitation, what is the bandwidth we have in all these centers, some of the places there may not be that kind of expertise. So we did a thorough planning to begin the whole exercise. And at the moment the planning is done thoroughly, the points of failure have almost come to zero. So when we started way back in 2017 till 2022, I would uh, uh, say that we were able to maintain an uptime of 99 plus percent for all our solar installations. Uh, with the limitation of whatever the staff, what we have in these centers. Again, thanks to rely on the technology. When I say that, uh, these days all the inverters can be monitored centrally with the help of remote monitoring system. So we do it uh, so rigorously so that there is no room for these systems are uh, down and no one is there to take care of that. So with that kind of a kind of a rigorous uh, tracking, we could maintain that so far as far as solar is concerned. And uh, as far as the uh, remaining things like the STPs and rainwater harvest filters or the solar water heaters, most of them are uh, relatively, I would say, that uh, not prone for that kind of a frequent breakdown, again with the proper preventive maintenance being taken care of. So we train all our staff who are supposed to handle them and take care of these things to maintain maximum uptime. That's how we could able to uh, ensure uh, there are centers where even 100% uptime we could able to drop with this kind of intervention. So our next question uh, comes to Mr. Tulsi Raj and also the others on the panel. Uh, ESG and the BSRS, which actually stands for Environmental, Social and Governance and Business Responsibility and Sustainability reporting, are gaining a lot of attention. So could you shed light on how this would impact eye hospitals since it's already impacting a lot of companies and industries? Uh... I, I'm I'm particular. I'm not sure. I fully am uh, equipped to answer this this question. Uh, but I, but what I can uh, say is that uh, increasingly that ecosystem is getting more and more enabling. You no, know, uh, for a long time the government regulations were not actually friendly for green energy or and this was because uh, all of us know that the government also is in the grid energy business. So when it comes to the grassroots, there seem to have been some level of, but that's being sorted out with uh, the central government's schemes and things like that. Uh, and the same is also happening with the uh, uh, corporate sector as well. So that ecosystem is definitely uh, becoming better and better. And, and I'm sure that with time, the, the policies and the uh, rules laid down by the different electricity board or the governments would also enable us to uh, kind of uh, utilize that uh, to, to, to a great extent. You know? So getting ready in that direction is, is, is very desirable. Uh, do any others want to add to that question? If I add, uh, I would say that the technology has also become so agile. A lot of uh, cost-effective technologies are available in all the space of climate change interventions, what we have spoken at length in the last one and a half hour. So with that, I think uh, these things can be very easily aligned for the overall common good of the end results that we are all aspiring for. So however small, however big the institution, whether it is a single uh, specialist owned hospital or an institution of a larger size, for everybody, there is a solution available in today's market. The too cost effective and the uh, icing on the cake is, it will definitely give much important saving their uh, most important valuable resources for uh, other purposes with the help of these interventions. Great, wonderful. Uh, I will quickly move on to the next question that is towards uh, Dr. Rajesh. So I'm combining two questions actually, which are on the similar topic. Uh, what are the difficulties that you face while installing solar system and how do you overcome those? 
And the other part of it is, are the solar panels with or without battery? Are you feeding the grid or for credit? So the answer to your first question is, means because we, we had this rooftop where we can install the solar panels easily. So in terms of installation, there were no great difficulties, but uh, because uh, in the West Bengal state, uh, there was a scheme where we need to have the net metering facility for the solar. So uh, we, we initially, initial the government or the electricity department was very cooperative initially, but when it was like that to get the net metering done and get the effective on ground situation, it was a little bit uh, tidy situation, but with due course of time, with all those efforts, which we need to put for a typical uh, department, all those things were sorted out. And regarding your uh, means next question, uh, these, uh, the solar panels, they are obviously connected through an AC and DC convertible system. So that way uh, the things are managed. Yeah, so, so there's no battery really. No, it goes no batteries. Yeah, it goes yes. to the grid directly. Yeah. Yes, go to the grid directly. Wonderful. Uh, so we do have one more question for Mr. Shiv Kumar. Uh, next is about one is the advice for hospitals interested to go solar. And also, does solar come with batteries and inverter? So it's a combination question for you. So if, if you're looking at doing a, a project with batteries, the cost is going to be almost double. So I think uh, majority of the projects today are going without batteries, which means it's grid connected. Uh, good thing is like uh, the previous speaker spoke that, you know, you have to go for, you have an option of going for net metering. So you sell whatever you generate to the grid and then you pick up whatever you want from it there. And the bill at the end of the day is net off. The other option is that you generate whatever you uh, during the day and you consume that, but you can't do the same thing in the night. Uh, so the best thing to do is go through the grid. And uh, this is the way forward. Uh, uh, if you're talking about a household, yes, it makes sense in having a battery backup. So if you're generating excess power, you store it and then use it in the night, but not for a CNI, that is a commercial in uh, industry. Wonderful to hear that. Um, so it's a good segue for us to move in from the audience Q&A to the concluding thoughts. So I will pass on the mic over to Mr. Tulsi Raj. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me just bring up a uh, uh, concluding screen. So, so in the interest of time, I wouldn't do any summarization because I think all of us were uh, listening to it. Uh, so, so I think what clearly came out is that uh, uh, if, if we, we are not only seized of the problem and we heard lots of examples, and we also have a lot of practical ways that we can uh, kind of um, uh, embrace this. No? And, and, uh, and if we do it right, no, we would, uh, we will be able to actually uh, create a value for the uh, community as a, as a whole. Now, which means uh, we are reducing patient efforts, giving them more value. This all this would come out of uh, how we design the services and and uh, give it. Uh, same way uh, as the hospital uh, embraces. Uh, this mindset or this approach or this way of working, uh, it, it would be, uh, it would come out of greater efficiency and productivity, which means more patients and you are adopting lean protocols and uh, which means lower costs, you know, which is again uh, beneficial to the hospital. And then this combination is going to uh, really help the environment by reducing uh, carbon emission. So, so I think all of us should probably recognize that uh, embracing this uh, principle you know, of uh, uh, reducing carbon emission really, uh, and we, as we succeed in it, it will really be a triple win. Now it is going to benefit us. When I say benefit us, it's going to benefit us from a business sense as well, in terms of a reduced cost or increased bottom line. Uh, definitely the community would get benefit because they're, they're 
the, the effort they have to put in is much less. And then the combination is going to uh, make our planet a yeah, yeah, much better place. So with this uh, optimum note, I want to uh, uh, kind of once again thank Mission for Vision for taking up this very important uh, topic and, and hand this back to Sri. Once again, thank you so much for everyone for joining us and taking out time for this particular topic. And also it was incredible to hear about uh, these strategies that are not only practical to implement, but also go a long way in protecting the environment. On the note of appreciation and gratitude, I would like to now invite Ms. Elizabeth Kurian, Chief Executive Officer of Mission for Vision, to deliver her vote of thanks. Thank you, Shri. Thank you, Shri. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the world you are. You would be aware that the sustainable planet was an important agenda of the recent G7 summit that concluded in Germany this week. There is great political drive towards uh, you know, sustainability even within the IL sector, and this webinar was organized to further those efforts and also to commemorate World Environment Day that fell this year, earlier this month. A sincere thanks to all the experts who so willingly accepted our invite to share their knowledge, experiences, and advice so brilliantly. Mr. Tulsi Raj, thank you very much for setting the context and for leading the session. Indeed, the impact of health on carbon emissions is quite alarming. And we agree the optimization of consumption and the utilization of resources is key towards promoting a healthy planet for future generations all towards a triple win for facility, environment, and the community at large. Thank you, as always, for your wise counsel and so willingly sharing your vast knowledge with us, and also for leading this for the iHealth sector globally as the founding chair of the IAPP Climate Action Working Group, and also practically demonstrating all of this at Aravind. Natasha, many thanks for enlightening us of the impact of global warming on eye disorders, and also sharing with us the global commitments of IPB and other global actors towards a better world. We agree completely that it is important for the governance and leadership structures of organizations to promote this issue within their teams and systems. The 10 key areas of action and the three key studies that you shared guided the way further for us. Thank you and Imran also for the valuable resources you have put together I would encourage all of us to access them at the IAPB website. Mr. Shiv Kumar, many thanks to Renews India and its parent group, NP Group, for their support towards the eradication of avoidable site loss for the past several years in India and Nigeria. It has been an honor to partner with you all along. Thank you for enlightening us about the value of solar energy and the recovery of investment towards it. SDG 17 is all about partnerships, and it's very important to have private sector engagement which is key to our efforts, and we would urge you to please continue your support and enhance it even further. Dr. Venkatesh, thank you for sharing your experiences with Arvind's low carbon eye care in such a lucid and practical manner. It is also heartening to know how the climate agenda is institutionalized within your ecosystem, involving patients and healthcare providers. I'm sure it will inspire many others to adopt your measures. We would certainly love to learn more from you. Mr. Banoj, it is inspiring that LV Prasad Institute has a focal lead for your environment agenda, which speaks volumes about its commitment to the protection of the environment. It was enlightening to learn about your 10 steps towards a green LV Prasad Institute, especially about your rainwater harvesting system. You have some of the most beautiful campuses in the world. Thank you so much for your message. Dr. Rajesh Saini, thank you so much for sharing your experience in empowering primary air care through solar energy in some of the most remote and challenged parts of India via green vision centers in partnership with August. Electricity can be a challenge in these areas and solar energy, what I understood from what you said, has its benefit not only towards the environment, but also in service continuity. Thank you also for sharing a costing analysis. It was really helpful. I'm sure the learning from your experiment will be of much value, especially to those in similar environments. My colleagues at Vision for Vision, Shri, for coordinating this webinar so excellently and for your efforts with preparations over the past weeks. Many thanks to Shobhatru Azim and Shubhrakanti for all the support behind the scenes. And finally, and most importantly, many thanks to the audience for your active participation. Our intention is to sensitize. We have a long way to go, and I hope our intention will help furthering the cause. Thank you again very much. 
Thank you. So thank you all. It was a wonderful session.